good afternoon sir good afternoon sir we are live okay so sir we'll begin the session a very warm greetings to all the participants and panelists present in today's session i aniket sachan co convener of the seminar committee of dr ram manohar lohia national university lucknow welcome you all to in this meaningful session on the topic the constitution and the environment it is really a golden opportunity and moment of pride for all of us to host former supreme court judge and chief person of national green tribunal justice swatantra kumar sir as a guest for the talk so has contributed immensely in the field of indian judiciary and has delivered judgments which have been constructive in nation's progress so had enrolled as an advocate delhi bar council in the year 1971 he is also been district judge in the himachal pradesh and later being counsel at the central council for pollution board apart from that he has also been the chief justice of bombay high court and in 2009 he was appointed as the supreme court judge meanwhile his in his tenure in ngt he has delivered notable judgments where if we come to the ban on the vehicles a 10 year ban on the petrol old vehicle petrols and also the subtle burning issues and the most notable one that is the art of living judgment so without further ado i would like to invite sir to commence this meaningful discussion well <clears throat> thank you uh, ms santan and uh, the university and the law department of the lucknow and uh, i do thank them for having provided me with an opportunity of speaking to all the participants and attendees of this webinar today as you just heard that we have to discuss today with regard to the environment and the constitution the constitution and the environment before we travel into the various facets in law or otherwise of these two essential concepts of the indian judicial system we need to understand that in fact what is the environment when we talk about what is environment then you look up to the umbrella act in india that is the environmental protection act 1986 and you know it's probably the word environment has been defined in very wide terms now the reason for it to be defined in such wide language appears to be its fundamental resources its fundamental sources are the international treaties international commitments of india and the unique diversity of our country which has so much of environmental richness inbuilt into our social life inbuilt into our customs inbuilt into our heritage over the centuries of the past now the expression environment is defined in the section 2a of the 1986 act and it says that it's an inclusive definition it says that it includes water land air and interrelation between human beings living creatures plants 
and microorganism. Now, if you think of this definition on its plain reading, I do not think you can keep anything outside the ambit and scope of environment in not only the Indian question, but even globally thinking. I don't think you can <coughs> have anything excluded from this definition, such a wide definition. And most importantly, it is the interrelation between the fundamentals of human life, that is the land, air and water with the human being. And, you know, they have gone to the extent of even including the organism or the, you know, kind of uh, microorganism, even plants, insects, everything is part of our environment. So that is the environment. And interestingly, when we talk of uh, pollution, you know, which is incidental to human existence, that when we people live on this planet, we tend to pollute rather than protect. So when we are talking of pollution, the law defines pollution as a solid, liquid, gaseous substance in such concentration that tend to be injurious to environment. Again, it is such a wide definition. Now, environment and pollution having been defined in such wide terms shows the concern of the legislature for protection of environment. The excess or violation in any of the activities or the results of the activity will always lead to pollution and that would violate the provisions of the Environmental Protection Act 1986. We straight away <coughs> try to look into that if this is the expression of environment, then we look into the ambit of constitutional dimensions in relation to environmental laws or the status of environment in our constitution. I am not sure how many of you are fully aware about what has been defined now in judgments is the golden environmental triangle under our constitution. You must have heard of the fundamental right, golden triangle of fundamental rights in our constitution. But another term that was coined by the tribunals in India was with regard to the environmental triangle in the constitution or the constitutional environmental triangle. Now, what is that? Now, if we think in these terms that what are the constitutional provisions which really make what I just mentioned to you as the triangle of the environmental protection in our country, then we straight away firstly go to Article 48A of the Constitution. Now, 48A falls under the chapter of directive principles which says that it will be the obligation of the state to protect 
our natural resources, to protect our rivers, water, air, and all other natural resources and environmental protection that in the state would have a duty to protect and not permit the environmental deterioration. The second part of this triangle is Article 51 AG, which places a constitutional duty upon the citizens identical to the obligation of the states under Article 48A of the Constitution, the directive principles. Now, the citizens are obliged to protect, ensure no degradation, and make all possible efforts to improve the environmental qualities in the country. Third is not the third part of this triangle does not originate from the language of the Constitution per se, but it was introduced by judicial pronouncements. When we talk about judicial pronouncements, means that Article 21 of the Constitution, which is just a simple one-line article giving you right to life, is the article which was expended by the Supreme Court in its judgments to say that the right to decent and clean environment is a fundamental right covered under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. Now, this is the constitutional status of environmental protection in our country. I do not think and subject to correction that any written constitution in the world provides for such a high pedestal of the environmental laws or environmental protection anywhere in the globe. It is, I think, a compliment to our framers of the constitution that they were so environmentally conscious that they provided for such a strong triangle and the real contribution thereafter has been by the Supreme Court of India where it introduced the most significant right of environment to the decent and clean environment. Now the result was that once it is a fundamental right all protection under the law and all enforcement under the law changes its color and methodology. So once we say it is a fundamental right of the citizens, the remedies available, the access to justice, the application of justice and the resultant directions of the courts and ensuring enforcement of the law became very, very prominent in our country with the passage of time. So that is the constitutional aspects and the, as I mentioned to you, of the constitutional protection of the environmental laws and the environment as it is, as I told you. Now, you will have to, I think it may be worthwhile just to clarify to all of you that, you know, the global approach to environmental protection and concerns for environment are shown by a large number of treaties, agreements, conventions at the international level. Now, the signatory countries are bound and therefore, they come back and they create laws, the domestic laws in consonance with the international environmental protection laws. Now, in our country, 
the constitution makes a specific provision under article 253 of the constitution by which they can and there is an obligation on the government central government and the parliament to make laws in consonance with the international treaties and that is how all our acts whether we talk of air act whether we talk of water act whether we talk of biodiversity act or we talk of the umbrella uh, environmental protection act 1986 all have been enacted with reference to international conventions and international conventions and international treaties whether they are geneva whether montreal whether paris or they are you know uh, the erstwhile uh, convention that were entered into so this is the frame structure of law in our country and uh, this is how the law of environmental protection in our country has developed now the next question that comes and automatically follows from this is that how does this business of the right to environment came into existence was it all of a sudden that this came or was it after some process or development of law in our country that this came now see article 21 of the constitution did not introduce the right to decent and clean environment all of a sudden it was not a kind of uh, you know a protection which was introduced by the supreme court kind of uh, very suddenly no if we see the development or the progress or the expansion of article 21 then you will see firstly came the personal right to be the fundamental right uh, this was uh, you know firstly developed and it came in the case of a uh, kharak singh versus state of uttar pradesh the first judgment amongst others which was very significant and said that your existence will not be existence that of an animal existence it has to be existence with human dignity so that was the first uh, concept second came through when we said that uh, in the case of uh, menika gandhi's case where they said that right to live means right to live with dignity and then came the sunil batra's case where it gave protection to protect your heritage and traditions so this and then came the judgment with regard to decent and clean environment so this has been the expansion of article 21 from time to time other developments as you know the right to life the right to livelihood the right to education all this has been introduced by the supreme court by process of judicial pronouncements so this all comes in this fashion and uh, we uh, can now very fairly examine that what happens with this frame structure so if this is the structure of constitution and the structure of the environmental laws as i mentioned to you that environmental laws primarily are enacted by the center that is the parliament of india now these laws were you know the water act was the first the prevention of pollution and control of water act 1974 that was the first legislation which came prior there too you had provisions somewhere linked provisions like criminal procedure court created provisions with regard to nuisance then you had the ipc making some penal provisions with regard to some small concerns about environment but then we had as you know that we had also the you know these uh, epidemics and uh, 
pandemics which are coming or others law related to them be had in place which it was invoked at different times so we have uh, not to be tell you precisely that we have enough environmental statutory laws one we have the constitutional stature then we have the statutory laws and then we have the laws that are to regulate and enforce the principal laws enacted by the legislature now we have the you know municipal solid waste rules we have the biodiversity rules we have medical uh, waste rules we have industries waste rules then we have uh, you know extraction of groundwater so we have enough legislations or the subordinate legislations in our country which deal with the aspects of environmental enforcement and environmental protection the one is the environmental laws other is the constitutional laws then comes that how are they put into play now they are put into play by three different sources or three basic points that is one is the policy framers policy framers on the one hand second is the regulatory authorities and third is the citizenry now these three let's uh, look into them from the practical point of view now policy framers make policies which are consonant with the principal legislation or the subordinate legislation all right now if they are so then the question is what should those policy makers do what is required of these policy makers these policy makers we think should be that they should have the technology and technological developments they must be keeping pace with them secondly they should be aware about economic growth thirdly they should be able to have balanced beneficial principles applicable in their policy framing and what policy they make they must ensure that it is an achievable policy so these are the four ingredients which the policy making authorities in our country must keep in mind then comes <coughs> the regulatory authorities now when we talk of regulatory authorities we have two different layers of the regulatory authorities one regulatory authority in law is which are directly regulating the environmental laws and others are which are indirectly participating in regulation and enforcement of environmental protective laws now the direct authorities are like central pollution control board you have the state pollution control boards which are created under the statute itself and then you have the biodiversity board you have now the ganga uh, cleaning authority you have other statutory authorities so these are the authorities which are directly implementing and enforcing the laws the other is indirect indirect means the different government departments like you know you have the directorate of health secretariat of health you have secretariat of industries you have secretary of uh, the, you know development so all of them have to confine themselves to ensuring that they do not permit people to carry on development which is injurious patently to environment protection and they carry on activities which are impermissible the licenses they grant have conditions of environmental protection so they are indirect regulatory and participating authorities now what are their main features are three that is the regulatory authority should have the capacity to control second ability to perform and third 
enforcement of law and ensuring protection of law. So these are the fundamental duties of the regulatory authorities, whether they are direct or indirect. Now, whatever be it may be, but yes, there are some space uh, required or the, some space for improvement on this particular aspect of the control of regulatory authorities that in our country lacks and it is causing some concerns. The third is the citizenry's contribution. Now see, no environmental protection laws or the constitutional obligations or the provided uh, duties under the constitution or the statutory law cannot be effectively implemented or enforced till the time the citizenries, the people of the country, genuinely have to participate and contribute towards the concepts that we have just mentioned. Now, what they are expected to do is, first is they must have environmental consciousness. That is the first thing. Second is they must have the change in mindset. So, you know, like the concept of not in my backyard. If you want a waste management plant or a waste to energy plant, you should not be objecting to it just because you are apprehensive. Because today those plants are like gardens if you really look at them properly and maintain them properly. So change in mindset and always to say, what can I do? What can I contribute? Not always the question what the authority and other person can do. So that is required very seriously. And then when you take the business decisions, you know, when we take the business decisions, there it would be, there it would be, the question will be that do I want my small intent to make more money at the cost of environmental degradation or do I apply balanced business principles or development principles by which I would ensure the protection of environment as well as my economic growth or development. So these are the basis of how the both laws can be effectively, you know, kind of uh, implemented, enforced, and then bring it to the fore. What is the most important feature of our existence? We now would shift to the other phase, and that is that how do we bring out the these three different concepts? Now, see, the last of the environmental laws in our country that was enacted was the <clears throat> National Green Tribunal Act 2010. Now that act, besides providing a specialized tribunal for administration of environmental justice and deciding environmental disputes of civil nature, the most important feature of that uh, act is section 20 of the act. So when we talk of section 20 of the act, the for environmental protection, there are established norms, there are established principles across the globe and they have been incorporated as a part of the statute under section 20 of the NGT Act, that is the principle of sustainable development, principle of precautionary principle, and which includes 
the intergenerational equity principle and lastly it is the polluter pays principle so the law says that the tribunal will decide cases on the basis of these three principles and this statutory obligation on the tribunal to decide cases on that is not a kind of a guidance it's not guidance it's in fact an essential feature of justice system or the administration of justice by the tribunal these principles have been applied by the supreme court by high courts from times much memor prior even to the 1996 act so examining these three principles we will discuss if time permits us we will discuss one or two odd cases on these application of these principles but these are the principles which are to be applied and they are applied across the globe by all courts tribunals and regulatory authorities to ensure that there is no irretrievable or irreversible loss to the environment and our natural resources so there are as you will see there are two main sections one is with regard to environmental protection and other is with regard to environmental upgradation or improvement of environment a uh, frankly we had not been able to do much on the later but the uh, prior we have been able to do little as a you know totally as a human humanity humanity living on this planet so it's not something unique to one country or the other <clears throat> but you have to ensure that you know how much of these principles can be applied now you know if we even can go into comparative study of the constitutional concepts on environment of uk us but that will take you to a very different direction and maybe we we'll leave uh, it for some other time if we have to talk again so now what i would now straight away bring to you is the the primary uh, you know uh, kind of uh, constitutional relationship uh, between the fundamental rights under the constitution or the statutory rights and the other rights now see when we talk of you know we have freedoms under the fundamental rights that is article 19 of the constitution gives you different kind of freedoms across the uh you know area and rights uh, right to move right to trade right to you know existence and other the speak freedom movement so all this is subject to reasonable restriction under article 19 itself so those restrictions of course has to be reasonable and they have to be having a nexus to the law for which they are being created but article 21 which includes the right to environment decent and clean environment is free of restriction it doesn't have any limitations so article 21 is not subject to restriction while article 19 is so this is the comparative between the two showing you the value worth and importance of the basic constitutional rights in relation to environment now let's with this background on different uh, spheres of uh, law and other things let's just have a look at some of the cases i will try to give you as uh, short as possible and uh, then let's see how it works out now another thing which i want to emphasize before i take you to the case law on uh, some you know 
important aspect. You need to remember one thing that uh, the contribution of the judiciary in relation to constitutionalism of environmental laws is really greatly appreciated across the world. Because if you see all important aspects of environment were firstly dealt with by the Supreme Court of India or some high courts and the tribunal from time to time and then they became a law or the judgment pronounced then resulted in issuance of subordinate legislation for regulating environmental protection. So if that be the idea, if that be the source, therefore this particular contribution of judiciary, which I told you is immense in environmental uh, development of the environmental jurisprudence is very appreciable. And we have been termed it as the judicial creativity you know, which people do sort of try to say judicial overreach, this, that and the other, which I think is a very, very incorrect term to use because uh, there is a marked difference between judicial overreach and judicial activism or judicial creativity. Judicial creativity is always in consonance with law and is primarily meant for expansion of law because it is the obligation of the court to expand law jurisdiction depending upon the facts of the case, the need arising and the requirements of law that call for such an order. So that is one of the major things that we do. And with this, now let me tell you the Supreme Court of India, the high courts and the tribunal has dealt with a lot of uh, important facets of human life while dealing with environmental jurisdiction. Now, the Supreme Court started as back as in the 80s with dealing with the Mr. Kamal Nath's case where it was obstruction to the flow of the river and the Supreme Court took a very serious view on that and directions were passed with regard to uh, bringing the law enforcement on its proper lines rather than its violation. Supreme Court then, as you know, Bhopal gas, then you know, the recent gas money case, then you have, you know, all environmental Taj, the pastries case, and then you have <coughs> the Ganga, the case, and then high courts have dealt with, Bombay High Court dealt with the gardens of Bombay, <clears throat> which was very, very important case at the relevant time. Then you have the um, Uttarakhand cases dealing with disasters. Then you have the, you know, Delhi High Court dealing with different environmental issues. Then the tribunal dealing with Yamuna, Ganga, air pollution of Delhi. Then the Glaciers case, then the Himalayan range, then the Simla uh, you know, uh, regulation of uh, indiscriminate construction all over the hills, <clears throat> right? Then the Calcutta, then, you know, all these issues will show you that how much concern and expansion of law was done by the judicial process of our country. Now, let me tell you that, as I told you, that uh, <clears throat> we will also try to go into the uh, case uh, law to some extent. So these are the ambit of the case laws that have been dealt with by the courts. Now when we talk of let's take a specific case of uh, how do you apply the principle of sustainable development. Now sustainable development means the principle of balancing. Put it more simply that when you take up a development project that doesn't mean that the environmental law only knows one thing, that you must stop the development. Certainly not, because the very 
incorporation of these principles into the statute of environmental justice delivery system in our country shows that development is presupposed you have to develop there's no doubt question is that you have to develop with sustainability sustainability means a balanced approach that is all it means that you must have development but the development should be balanced it should not be irretrievably or irre irreversibly injurious to environment or natural resources means that you should not destroy the natural resource to an extent that you practically extinguish that particular resource or source of our that environmental strength now let me give you a very small example of how this can be done and how in the same case the principles enunciated can be applied to now the case that i am going to uh, discuss with you this uh, evening is the you know it was a case it's a it's a uh, title case as a tribunal on its own motion in the case of tara devi hills now what happened in this case was if you people are aware about and i'm sure most of you must have been to simla so just around about uh, 12 11 12 kilometers before simla there is a place called tara devi now there is a temple of the goddess there on the top of the hill so that hill uh, you know it's a massive hill and uh, part of this massive hill was owned by a private party and that private party was having its uh, house its uh, you know small shed and the entire forest under it now the forest that he had uh, the party had was uh, having more than around about 700 trees of chil and deodar and other trees which were more than 50 to 75 years old and they were having a serious contribution to the uh, controlling of oxygen levels there and the reduction of carbon dioxide and the journal contribution that was being made to the ecology environment and the biodiversity of that area including the animals who used to be living there so this was a source of uh, you know great uh, besides natural beauty it was a source scientifically proven source of environmental protection now what this party did was a great builder from somewhere came and he entered into an agreement to buy this whole hill uh, along with that tiny house that constructed in the middle of the hill and uh, you know as you know that whenever there is a uh, uh, unless until it is on a particular height and this height was on about 5000 plus uh, feet so you know they all the nature itself leaves some spaces in between so this huge hill had pockets which were tree free you know there were no trees there and there was just small ground pockets which were there so this builder bought the entire hill and uh, i don't know i don't remember but i think it was something like 13 crores or something so they bought that hill and uh, his plan was to construct a five uh, star seven storied hotel there and obviously to construct a five star seven storied hotel there you had no space so the thing was to cut the trees so the, what this man did was that on one fine evening he cut practically all the trees 700 trees he chopped them off mechanically over the evening and night and in the morning 
that hill was bald hill it was free of such highly dense forest and it had a different look than what it used to be now his scheme was to after cutting to construct the hotel there and you know work it out for economic benefits now the question that arose was nobody complained of it uh, you know uh, the bench of the national green tribunal was sitting in the uh, simla at that time for other cases and in the newspaper front page carried this news so then the notice was issued by the tribunal suomoto and after issuing notice of its own accord the parties were called and then immediately the next morning the you know obviously the government officials were involved otherwise you know to wipe out a hill full of trees is not a joke and so the forest department would be after the blood of anybody but it was done probably in a very uh, planned way and therefore the after issuing the notice now i'll tell you about the direction passed by the tribunal a little later but let me tell you what was at stake or what was the intention stake was as i told you that the natural asset was being completely extinguished and irretrievably lost its impact on the whole simla territory would come and seen it will lead to lack of fall in generation of oxygen therefore reducing the oxygen values of that area increase in carbon change in climate and it would also be divesting the biodiversity of that area ecology would be disturbed and this whole area of himalayan range is eco sensitive therefore removing of complete hill trees would be totally injurious to the hill itself because it will be destabilized now what was the benefit the benefit of the man was not to do sustainable development but to do unsustainable development and to make lot of economic benefit at the cost of destroying natural resources now this economic greed took over the economic uh, the environmental interest environmental protection environmental regulation environmental enforcement everything was thrown to the winds so now he could have done is that he could have had those pockets which were empty to create huts there you know because people who are coming to spend their holidays in simla they can spend money whether you ask them in a five star hotel room or in a hut would be the same thing so he they were not satisfied because that will be less in number economic growth will be balanced so that was a balanced or sustainable development if you just covered those pockets made good you know huts or houses there rented them out or served them as regular hotel even no he didn't do that but he messed it up thoroughly so what did the tribunal do tribunal to enforce sustainable development issued an injunction that there will be no construction on that hill at all secondly you will replant those trees you know nature has a great power so there are some stems because they were just cut recently they could be revived so the forest department was given direction to examine that the stems which can be revived they should be revived forthwith and then instead of 700 the if i don't mistake i think it was direction was 4000 trees to be planted in the same area or in the area around that area at the cost of that builder and the owner of the property another direction that was passed was that there will be no hotel constructed on that hill at all next direction that was passed was that both of them was fined i think quite a bit of an amount and uh, 
I think they were asked to pay something like uh, 50 lakhs each or something. They were fined, bear all the expense of afforestation again, and to ensure that then there is no construction. And the forest department was directed to comply with the directions and report to the tribunal. So fine means now this is what it shows you. Violation of principle of sustainable development, therefore directions with regard to complying with sustainable development. He polluted the environment, therefore polluter paid principle invoked and he was directed to pay fine as well as compensation for environmental degradation. Precautionary principle invoked that whatever was left over should be revived again and precaution should be taken to replant trees at huge area and revive that area into the same environmental status and see that it's if it is possible to restore its biodiversity, its ecological value and to ensure that the environmental degradation in any case was no further than that. So this was a case where all these three statutory principles were invoked by the tribunal and the tribunal was very, very concerned with the enforcement. So that comes the last part of our talk is the enforcement of law. So then what will happen is, as you know, that under the writ jurisdiction, the High Court or the Supreme Court issues revolving writs. So revolving writs, when we talk about this was a revolving directions where the authorities were directed to report back to the tribunal and show that the orders have been complied with and thereafter the progress thereof. So this is the compact uh, example of application of these three principles which we have talked about and these principles are applied very carefully and very, very, you know, cautiously. Now the question that really matters is that the court also, the court, the tribunals or the environmental jurisdiction exercise itself has to be in a very balanced way because sometimes there are properties which are developed you know at the cost of the people's state and their damage done to the natural resources is restorable and it is not irretrievable so then you pass direction for doing all this so with these things i think i will uh, thank everybody for the opportunity given and if you have any questions, you are very welcome to ask them. Thank you, everybody, and the college especially. Thank you, sir, for this session. It was really wonderful insight to hear from you regarding the frameworks in the Constitution to cater for the protection of environment. And the most important thing which you dealt upon, that is the Tara Devi case and how the situation was dealt by the NGT regarding the injunction and the fine for the afforestation thing. Because such issues normally what happens that uh, the courts and also what the tendency of the law students is that they cater to not really deal with the environment issues. These come only in our knowledge when they reach to certain high level of publicity or in the social media when we come across them. Because environment today also is such an issue that is not being catered as we see that the government also progressing on the ease of doing business concepts and also not catering too much of environment in the name of development. So the inputs which you have given will really help law students like us to work towards protection of environment and be very cautious when it comes to environment issues. So, sir, now I would like to move on towards the questions and uh, we have certain questions which have been asked by students. Uh, you uh, Like you can also access in the comment section. Meanwhile, I can read you read for you. So, sir, are the questions available to you? No, no, you can speak them. They are not coming on the screen. I think the private chat. Yes, sir, in the screen. No, in the comment section. So, just next to the private chat. No, it's a blank as well. Okay, so I'll just read the questions for you. So, the first question is by Asa Shivare. She is asking that, sir, do you think that litigation in the field of environment law is not as popular as the litigation in other fields? If yes, then what are the probable reasons for the same? Well, I think, uh, you know, I won't say that the environmental jurisdiction is not being invoked by the people 
uh, of our country were presently uh, sufficiently. I think there was uh, great concern. I think the people, you know, I do not know the state of affairs uh, presently because, but when I was in NGT, I used to get around about 30, 40 cases a day. So it was not that people, people are very environmentally conscious and they were becoming very progressive on their approach to environmental protection. So I don't think environmental and one thing good in our country is that our high courts, Supreme courts and the tribunals uh, access to justice, environmental justice is very easy. So it's not very expensive. It's not very formal. It's not very technical. So, you know, there were cases when even the letters were treated as uh, petitions and dealt with. So I don't think I, I think it's fairly, but ultimately it's for people to invoke or not to invoke. And so you can't do anything. Yeah. So next question is by Sakshi Agrawal and she asked that, sir, how sustainable development can be ensured by the latest EIA 2020 draft notification providing ex post facto approval of environment clearances? See, firstly, the 2020 notification has not come into force as far as I know. Uh, it is not being uh, you know, notified for enforcement as yet. But secondly, the concept of uh, ex post facto sanctions or approvals, whether under the Forest Act or under the Environmental Protection Act, is not a bright idea. I don't think it's a very bright idea because, uh, and I think if I don't mistake, there is a judgment of the tribunal or Supreme Court probably, which disapproved, uh, I think, uh, Justice Dhananjay uh, Chandrachud. Uh, his judgment uh, there in a very recent time on ex post uh, factor. And I don't think the Supreme Court has approved of it. But then, you know, maybe it can do some good also, but I'm not so sure. So next question is by Yakub Alam. And he asked that recent draft, EIA draft has been opposed by civil societies, environment activists and various people. What are your views on EIA draft notification and what changes could have been incorporated? Well, this will uh, need uh, time more than what we have already talked about. That means it will need a very, uh, you know, I think more than an hour to tell you what is what. But I think by and large, uh, 2020 notification has its own uh, values and devalues. So like any other legislative or uh, subordinate legislative document, so I think it uh, it needs to be tested uh, by the judicial process. That's all I would say. So one question I would also like to ask regarding this, that uh, as we know, mm -hmm. the government is promoting ease of doing business. And when it comes to business, many times environment has been ignored. So do you think that there can be a proper balance strike to maintain the concept of this ease of doing business with the international developments like we have borrowed from conferences like sustainable development and other principles? of intergenerational equity also, which we have borrowed. See, certainly, yes, you can. Uh, as I told you, the 2020 notification has some features which are very, very, uh, you know, intended to expedite the work, uh, you know, to classify classifications, etc. But what you need to do is see, you should not work with a, you know, mindset of, uh, negativity you should have very positive approach to legislation so what i would think is you can certainly bring in uh, you know you should always uh, now suppose the government says that okay this work was being done let's say the public hearing process was being done in uh, six months we will do it in three months so if without injuring the sense of public hearing they can do it in three months then they should be complimented for it you know, so it is it is what you do out of it. It's not what you write. I think what is how will you enforce this notification? So if you are able to execute works intent. Good for the environment, then certainly I think it should be appreciated. So this is the last question by Atre in which he asked that is there any mechanism in the law which considers or hear the concerns on case to case basis? as in the case of Nanda Devi National Park. Sorry, I missed that question, please. Can you repeat your question? 
so sure, sure. Uh, sir is there any mechanism in law which considers or hear the concerns on case to case basis especially dealing with the case of nanda devi national park yes there case to case yes that's true because uh, it depends on who approaches the tribunal whether you approach it in a generic sense you approach it on an individual case you have a particular issue to be decided and sometimes in cases consequential issues become more relevant than the main case you know if you see uh, you know uh, for example the ganga itself the main judgment dealt with more ancillary issues because unless and until the ancillary issues are corrected settled and enforced properly the main issue can't really proceed further so it is not that you uh, always have to emphasize i think there are cases also which are decided on case to case basis that's true it depends on how does the litigant approaches the system that will be the okay so i take your permission so, to leave please yes sir with this today i like to end and i would like to thank you for taking time from a busy schedule and uh, giving opportunity for us and it, we will be sure when this covid situation end to grace you in a college and have much more inputs from you sir okay thank and you I sir for giving time all your attendees students best of luck best of health best of future thank you thank you sir thank you very much